Kumute Radio, in association with Flow Combat, brings to you the Chronicles of Ensign Anyway, Part 2. In this episode, Ensign talks about playing racquetball professionally and how one shot during the Pro Tour changed the course of his life. He also delves into moving to Japan for the first time and adjusting to the society and how watching Hicks and Gracie compete in Valley Tudo was part of the reason why he started to fight. All of that and more on this episode. Make sure to check out Ensign's website, destinyforever.com, and follow the legend on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Without further ado, let's get it. The Chronicles of Ensign Anyway, part two. It's finally here. Ensign, you've been a busy man. You've been all over the world, everywhere, Hawaii. I've seen that you're out in the East Coast in the United States doing seminars and stuff like that. Yep, in Pennsylvania, I was there for a while. You almost got hit by a tornado? Yeah, it hit the next town. <laughs> Something yeah. you'll never see in Japan, huh? That's foreign to me. Even, you know, in Hawaii or Japan, tornadoes are non-existent. Now, from part one, you know, there's some questions that people send to me. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. I think we've got about four questions that I, uh, that I have. So the first okay. one is from Jason Johnson in London, England. He says, he asked you, as a teenager, when did you feel the most in danger? When did I feel the most in danger? In danger meaning what? In danger, I guess he's probably meaning like when you were fighting, you know, with Taurus and you said that uh, you didn't, you weren't really that, you're lucky that you didn't get, you know, like really seriously, you know, hurt or anything like that. So when, when you, when did you feel like you were the most in danger, like a, like a, a fight that you got into or something like that, where you got, where you slipped away? Oh yeah, I had a, um, there was an incident in high school that, um, one of our friends was got into a, a big uh, argument with a guy from the other side of the island, and uh, we uh, it was like a we didn't know how much people they were going to come with, so we gathered our guys. They came in their cars and met us on our side of the island, and when we met, I remember we were, we had oh, shit. We must have had about a dozen guys, and we we're standing. Uh, in front of our cars and then those guys put up in three loads of cars and they all came out and we were all we're like um i'm pretty much we we're there to just uh make sure nobody jumps in in the fight it was supposed to be a fight on one-on-one -on -one. and then we're standing there and i'm standing in the front and then the um the guys confront each other and I noticed uh, the guy on the other side was starting to like kind of back down saying, yeah, I don't want any problems. Started backing up, backing up. <clears throat> Our friend kept kind of persisting it to the point where the guy kept backing up to a point where he got to his car, bent over, reached down to grab something and came up and pulled out a gun. He pulled the gun out and then he kind of aimed it at our friend and our friend was kind of like, yeah, shoot me, shoot me. And we were kind of like, oh, stop saying that. <laughs> it was kind of going kind of nuts and then he was saying shoot me shoot me go ahead shoot me and then he kind of as my friend was saying that he was kind of backing up too because you know he was challenging him but he was backing up and then the guy uh actually pulled the gun away from him and, and kind of looked at us and kind of panned the gun right across us too and that was like kind of freaky because we're like whoa we kind of didn't know what to do and then it was funny because out of all the guys we had, we were lined up against our cars. One of our friends decided to, he didn't want to do this. And he started running, like, you know, like kind of taking off. And as soon as he ran, I guess all of us had kind of like fear in us too, yeah? So we all like scrambled like cockroaches. Once he started running, we, I guess everyone got scared and started running. And I remember running down the street like down the little street I saw a parked car and I said I'm going to be, go behind the parked car and I remember running down the street and just having that image and how it feels to be shot and thinking oh how am I going to feel am I going to make it behind that car? I'm like almost like feel like I'm running slow motion think, how am I going to make it behind that car oh, how's it going to feel if I get shot in the back of the head 
and nothing um he didn't shoot the first he didn't unload the weapon he didn't discharge it um nothing really happened but um that was for me that was like the one of the scariest times when i was little like kind of thinking if i was actually gonna die that day how old were you at that time i was uh was in high school so i was uh 17 16 or 17. yeah you were saying you know last time that guns were very scarce you know you never really saw a gun so did that maybe a reason why it was a, such a shock to you because most people didn't pull out guns at that time yeah the worst we usually had before was knives so that wasn't that much of a problem as guns and then when that gun came out we everyone was kind of like whoa and then he, it was a real freaky feeling because he panned it across all of us right across and when it came across me i was just think i was just wondering if if he pulled the trigger and I got shot, it was like, it's just a matter of, you know, that time span when he panned across me thinking like, wow, my life actually could end in that short time span that he's panning across. If he decides to push the trigger or if the trigger went off like accidentally. So that was a real, um, I guess a wake up call because we're standing in front of the cars with our baseball bats and stuff. And it, it felt, you, you felt, you felt almost um, defenseless. Although we thought, you know, we felt safe with the baseball bat. When that gun came out, he panned it across us. We realized that this baseball bat's not going to really do much for us. There's always a guy in the crew, you know, that is the tough guy that always wants to say, shoot me, shoot me, right? There's always a guy, like, there's always the guy, right? That's, yeah, there's always that crazy one, yeah. Always. All right, so the next question comes from Justin Lee in hong kong he says when you played sports what was the most memorable like altercation that you had as a as an athlete like you said you got into you know fights with people and like the referees and you were a hothead so what was the most memorable one that you had memorable meaning probably not good at the time but it's kind of funny now when you think about it i remember there was uh, one incident where we were playing another district team um and i was this is when i was little uh she i think i was about 12 12 years old i remember hitting the ball running to first and i remember the ball was kind of semi in outfield so i thought i could make it to second so around the corner headed for second as soon as i got to second the sec the second baseman had the ball and he kind of held it and it was right in front of me so i figured i got no chance so i just stuck my head and kind of stuck him and he fell to the ground and the ball rolled out of his uh, hand so I looked up and the ball kind of rolled far away so like okay I get to third so I got to third started running up running I got up started running to third and the same thing happened where the ball got ahead and then he had it and he held it and I did the same thing I did the same thing where I stuck the guy the ball went rolling out and I remember getting looking at the ball like I can make it home so I got up started running home and then the, the same thing happened where the catcher caught the ball in, ahead of time. And I stuck my head down and tried to stick him over. And it, I, we, we, I knocked him over, but he held him to the ball, so I was out. And then the whole team on that side was pissed off. And we, it was, it was like, kind of like we're little kids, though. Huh? So we're, they were pissed off and started screaming at each other. And then I remember um, my dad got all heated up from that. And he started having an argument because the other coach started coming to yell at me and I was a little kid. So my dad started, Bashard came and started yelling at the other coach and they started getting to like a shoving match and it ended up where me and my dad both got ejected at the same time. <laughs> so we have to leave the field, yeah? So I guess my father was a head coach, but the assistant coaches took over. And then I remember driving home in the car, my dad calling me Stupid! See what you caused. <laughs> but both of us were going home because we got we had to leave the premises. <laughs> that was kind of memorable. <laughs> yeah. Um, another question that was sent in George Henderson in New York. He said he asked, "What was the most frustrating martial art to learn out of all the martial arts you've learned in the past? What was the most frustrating? What 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 did what martial art did you have hard time learning?" Um. The most frustrating was probably karate because I was, uh, I think I was like five or six years old at the time. 
And I remember having to memorize the katas. And you know, when you do the katas, everything has to be, you know, your stance has to be right. The, the form has to be right. And I remember um, when I was in, you know, we start off the class with the, you know, our stance, you know, and you have to have the proper stance. So the teacher would go around and uh, um, kind of kick our legs to check if our stance was sturdy or not. I remember he came over to me and he kicked my legs and then he kicked my legs out and I fell on the ground. And I remember getting up and running out, crying out of the place, grabbing. I mean, I was so tiny that I couldn't reach the, the pay phone. Mm -hmm. I remember asking a construction worker, well, I didn't have money. So I asked a construction worker, I think it was a dime to call it back in the day. I remember asking him for a dime that I can call my parents and they had to ask him to put the money in and grab the receiver and dial the number for me. And he did. And then my dad came and picked up and I never went back to karate. So I got to say karate was probably my most frustrating because as a kid, I didn't really understand the dynamics. And when the teacher came and tripped me, I remember just like, I guess embarrassment and shock and I just run out of there. And I I didn't think I would ever do martial arts again. And look, look what I ended up doing, yes. <laughs> I remember that teacher, I know his name too, Daryl Lee. So I don't know, I was, he was older. I think he was in his like his twenties or thirties at the time when he was teaching. And I was like, maybe like five or six, so. It would be an awesome thing to actually meet him up again, meet up with him again. But <laughs> I wonder if he's still alive, you know, we say hi and just kind of see if he even remembers that, you know, <laughs> maybe hopefully he's listening to this and then, you know, he'll reach out to you or something. You well, know, that'd be kind cool, of man. If you were walk into Hilton Wiki Beach Hotel when I'm doing my bracelets in July and say, Hey, an old man walks in and say, Hey, remember me? I'm your ex instructor, your ex, ex uh, karate instructor, Daryl Lee. That'd be freaking classic. Yeah, man, you could probably, you know, hook him up with a bracelet or something, you know? Yeah, for sure, man. That'd be cool, man. <laughs> it's always good to, like, you know, I guess meet meet up with somebody that kind of affected you in your life in the past and kind of put everything to, you know, put everything in the past and just kind of move along and kind of reminisce about what happened. Yeah, that's always nice to have. Um, when you see, like, Machida and... Steven Thompson and Michael Page, these guys are karate guys that are coming into MMA. And, uh -huh. but, you know, they're, they're having a lot of success. What do you think about that style of you know, martial art now? You had a difficult time doing it. Well, um, karate, I felt that was, um, as far as practicality, it was a little different because a lot of the uh, movements and punches were all based on form and um more uh more like a role of um, uh more more like a show type of uh style and um i guess you know there's all different types of karate where you cannot strike to the head you cannot you only got hit by you only can kick to the head but i mean karate i think is such a discipline you know it's a it's a real discipline art where you know the forms are real important and uh, you know the the the, the you know, when you, you, you pull back when you punch mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So I think it's a real discipline art. So when the guys who I think have gotten to like that elite stage of it, like, you know, Machida, they've been training their whole life with it. I think that's why it's so effective, you know, because it's, it's really, I think it's a real difficult art to actually pick up in the beginning because there's, there's so much uh, basic standards, like stance, has to have a nice stance. The, the forms were important there. The last question that we're going to get into kind of like ties in perfectly with, you know, what we, what we kind of like left off with last time, you know, we did this was this guy, Jason Kim, he's asking from uh, Portland, Oregon. He says, you said you played racquetball in the States. How good were you at racquetball? I was really good in the island of Hawaii. I became the state champ. Um, as far as uh, national wise, um, I think the mo best I've done in the age bracket when I was younger was like best 16, maybe or even not even maybe best 32s. Uh, I went on the pro rankings with my brother, the pro tour. And my best pro ranking that I had was 28 in the world, which uh, is, isn't that good. So 
how good was I? I think if I were to walk in most local clubs, I would probably be able to beat the club pro back in the day. Mm-hmm. But as far as uh, comparing myself to the best pros in the world, I think I, I, I'd like to I'd say I, like, I was like a, a notch below them. So I was never to that caliber where I was ever a threat to win any tournament. But I was always that – I was always dangerous enough that I – there was a possibility I could be on a hot streak and might, might be able to beat one of the top players. But um, not ever consistent enough or to that level where – I was a threat to win a tournament. My brother was on a whole different level, though. He was, like, probably a lot of times one of the favorite or one of the top four to win the tournament, yeah. Now, racquetball, is that the reason why you went to Japan for the first time? Because we were, we yeah. left off with, like, going to Japan. So now let's talk about Was it racquetball the reason, or was there a different reason? It was racquetball. 100% racquetball. So, like, you know, when I – um. Did I tell you the story about um, me missing the shot in racquetball? No. Okay. Well, this is how it all starts, actually. is um, We're on the racquetball tour. Um, me and my brother were on the tour. Egan was, uh, you know, sponsored by big sponsors. and He had, like, hotel sponsors, clothing sponsors. So I, was, uh, I wasn't good enough to actually get the exact type of sponsorships he had. I would have, like, the same shoe sponsor but not get as much as he gets and um my if i had any racket sponsors i wasn't enough i wasn't good enough that they would cover my rooms and everything they would I would, they would maybe give me a couple free rackets to play with um but egan was a good like wrote a top player so it was a full sponsor so what was convenient for me was um my mom they would take care of my flight i wasn't making enough to pay my own flights out my mom would take care of my flights and then I would just stay in Egan's room and, you know, use the car Egan uses because his sponsor paid for everything. So I kind of leached off Egan and, you know, as a racquetball, I, I toured for a couple of years and I think the best ranking I got was 28. And then there was a nas- national tournament. It's the last tournament of the day. I mean, of the year. So we went to a national tournament. It's the last tournament of the year. So it had double points. I was seated with this uh, racquetball player, Daniel Bremsky, and he was number 12, and I was 28. So what happened with that is um, if every time you go into the round of 32s and you advance around the 16s, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, you get points. So the more points you get accumulated to your rank, you get elevated in rank, or you, you stay at a round, you drop if you don't get as much points. So that tournament, I was playing Daniel Bremsky. It was in a round of 32s. And if you make it to the round of 16s, for me, at my rank, if I made it to the round of 16s, I would have enough points to um, uh, be in the top 24, which is the following year. So what happens with the racquetball tournaments is that the top 24 people in the, in the world are seated in the tournament. But they start off, of course, you know, tournaments start off in the round of 32. So 24, there's eight seeds. So what they would do is have a, every, every town that the racquetball tour would go in, all the pros would be traveling. And they'd have eight open slots. So any pro, rank pro that was under 24 and any local player that lived in the area, the top local players would all get into a, a small tournament before a tournament to qualify for the top eight spots. So that was like, a, it was harsh on you because you had to play a couple matches before the, the actual draw started. So I was actually made in, I won, I won my qualifying. I got into the tournament. I got into the round of 32. And because I was the, you know, the top 16, you know, when you see number one will, will, will um, play 32, number two will play 30, 31. You know, how, you know how you play the weakest player with the best player so that you get to draw even where the top players end up on the end. So I was number 16, so I played number 12. Oh, no, I was, I was sorry. I was number 28, so I played number 12. So when I played that guy, Dan, um, I remember I won the first two games. It was a game three, or best of three out of five. I won the first two games. I lost the third, and the fourth game I had him ten eight. Um, I and when I had that ten eight shot, I had a perfect shot come in like right in front on the top, the front of the court, a shot that I could. Ninety nine point nine percent of the time in practice, I would bury that shot without a problem because it was a really easy shot. Like we call it a plum in racquetball. A plum comes up and it's super easy, and it's something happened and I missed the shot. Um, so the bad things that happen because of missing the shot is 
I lost. I ended up losing the the, the match. I I lost. I lost that match. Uh, I had them 10 8, so I needed one more. It was a best out of 11. I lost that 11, I think it was 11 10. I lost into the falling mat, the falling, the tiebreaker. I lost that also. So because I lost, I didn't go up in rank. Um, and when I didn't go up in rank, the, the next, the following year, the pro tour was cutting like their tour stops in half. So for me, it was, wasn't feasible to have my parents pay my flight i still had to go to every tournament qualify i wasn't guaranteed i was going to be in the top 32 and be able to play and make points in the round so i might my ranking to go up would be so much harder so i had to actually sit back and say you know is it even worth what i'm doing and because i missed that shot and i was like still at the 28th rank um for me i had to sit back and kind of realize that you know, maybe it wasn't a smart idea to continue and had to maybe go back to school because I stopped school because I wanted to tour in the racquetball tournament, to a racquetball tour to try and see how good I could do in the world. And uh, Egan was so good that he, you know, he had full sponsorship, so he continued playing. So what happened was I retired, um, went back to school, and this is where everything starts. I went back to school, went to get all my classes, and then there was a non-credit course called Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And um, I went back to school, was settling in school, you know, started doing that Gracie Jiu-Jitsu stuff. I fell in love with it and found a way to channel my energy because I wasn't playing racquetball anymore. Then Egan gets the offer to go to Japan. But because he's busy in his pro tour, he couldn't go. So the next step was, oh, what about your little brother? He used to play. Does he want to come up and play? So they flew me up. I figured, ah, I didn't really have any interest in Japan. I was more like a free trip, check out a new country. Um, I heard that Japan players aren't as good. So, you know, a little bit of practice, I should be able to win the tournament. So I went up there. Um, I actually, actually that first time I didn't win the tournament, but I lost in the finals and I got really um, bothered by that. Went back and practiced. They flew me up the next, I think a couple months later for another tournament, ended up winning that. After winning that tournament, they told me, that they want me to do seminars. So after I had a three-month visa. So they said, why don't you stay in Japan for the, the remainder of the three months, live out a hotel and do ter um, seminars. So I went around Japan doing seminars for them. It just ironically, the last stop of my tour was up north in Fukushima. And I remember at that time, after touring the, the country, um, teaching seminars, I remember thinking that, oh, Huh, what am I I kind of started enjoying the country and I always thought that I wonder if, if I stayed here and learned the language enough to go I mean I love the beach I love I love surfing I love to be in the water so I didn't ever thought or think of leaving Japan so I thought I'd make that sacrifice learn the language maybe one year go back to Hawaii and then I'll have like a big uh, I'll have a big opportunities to um, get better jobs because there's a lot of Japanese tourists in uh, Hawaii at the time so I Go and I, I'm thinking that, but thinking how would I be able to stay in Japan? I need a visa and everything. So I'm at the last club and there's a baseball coach that used to coach uh, baseball in Hawaii. And I was a little avid baseball player. So I wanted, I, he, he came in and he recognized me. I recognized him. We said hi. And I, you know, one day, one night we went to dinner after the seminar and he kind of, we kind of started talking and he kind of mentioned about, oh, no, teaching in Japan. And I was like, ooh. And I kind of mentioned to him about trying to live in Japan maybe for a year, learn the language. And he told me, oh, why don't you work for my English school? You can teach English and learn Japanese here. So I was like, whoa, that's a chance. So took him up on his offer, got into Japan, started teaching English, a couple years. And you know, the thing is right at this moment right now, I'm in Japan, yeah, I'm teaching English, trying to learn. I'm going into a new direction in my life, but up even still till to that day, like, three or four years later after that racquetball shot that I missed, that still ate up, ate me inside. Like if I made, I didn't make that, I always thought if I didn't make that, if I didn't miss that racquetball shot, I would have been higher in the rank. How would have done in the pro tour? I would have been more, I had more years in the pro tour. I remember that ate me up. I remember there were times when I would go into court, even in Hawaii after that, I missed that shot. Even in Japan, years later, I would feed myself that same, same shot, how it came. And I would pretend like I'm in that tournament again. And I would pretty much almost, uh, almost I would almost want to say 100% of the times, that was such an easy shot. I would bury the shot where it would end the game. 
and it always eat me like if I only did that in that one in the tournament I would have won I would have had a better ranking blah 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 and you know that was to me that was like the worst thing that happened to in my life um when I went to Japan and all this started happening two years one year after teaching English I felt like I didn't have enough um English, uh, Japanese, memorized enough to, to retain it. So I decided to extend another year. And from that, it, it led up to many things that we'll probably talk about in the later um, segments of it. But for that, it ended up where I started running a racquetball company, blah, 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 started fighting, and it ended up taking off. I remember sitting back and thinking to myself that, you know, that shot that I missed, uh, like say it was 10 years later, I, was, I ended up in Japan owning gyms and everything. I remember sitting back thinking about that shot and thinking, wow, it does kind of give me a little bit of queeze of, of a sadness that I missed that shot. But then when, you really, when I really sat back and thought that if I didn't miss that shot, I wouldn't have been in Japan. I, I, I wouldn't have gone to college. I wouldn't have got Rishi Jiu-Jitsu. I would have been busy on the pro tour, so I wouldn't be able to have taken that offer to come play in Japan. So kind of interesting for me that the, something that I thought was the worst thing that happened to my life ended up to be the best thing that happened to me. So going back to the question about why did I go to Japan, I went for a racquetball term. That's it. I just went for a racquetball term and only because Egan was too busy. My brother Egan was too busy on the pro tour and I retired and I, I had a lot of time that I could go and take that free trip to Japan. So I went to play racquetball. And lo and behold, you know, there are times when, you know, people out there are having, like, a bad situation happen in their life, and they think it's a bad thing. You know, I, I always believe from that time that I, that racquetball experience, I always believe, even till today, that every experience that happens to you is, is meant to happen for some reason. Something you have to learn, or some way God is channeling you to another path. And it's funny because for 10 years, almost a decade, I, I thought that, that shot was the worst thing that happened to me in my life. And 10 years later, it took, took 10 years to have faith and continue to strive for what I wanted to do. It took me 10 years later to realize that that shot was probably the, one of the best things that happened to my life. So that shot is like your ter the turning point in your life, basically to lead to everything else that has happened that is great in your life, that has led you to so many experiences, so many uh, meeting so many different types of people all this stuff right yeah that shot what, what little did i know yeah at the time i didn't know but that shot was like a real big turning point in my life the the big question is when you went to japan how difficult was it to learn the language oh when i went to japan okay so um I remember when I went there, to f when I first got to Japan, my grandparents came and visited me. Their Japanese was real broken, but they, when we went around, I remember them having to speak because I had no, I didn't have any Japanese language. I took it in high school, but I cheated through the class and fooled around and didn't learn a thing. And I remember going up there and my grandparents had to speak. And I remember looking at my grandparents speaking to me, oh, if I could only speak like them. And ironically, it's funny because when you live in Japan and you, so, you know, you're living in America or, or if I'm living in Hawaii and I say, okay, I want to learn the language. I want to speak Japanese and you, you study the language. No matter how much you study the language, because it's not a necessity and it's something that you want to do, not you need to do, it, you have a hard time retaining and, and actually absorbing and learning. But for me, when I was in Japan, everything I did was in Japanese. I went to the market, it was Japanese, and I went to... um. um Outlet people, they talk, spoke in Japanese, went to the sports club, was in Japanese. When everything I did, went to the bank, everything was in Japanese. So for me, I guess for anyone that if it's a necessity to live, I think there's a little bit of different of an incentive and a little bit of different of a drive. So when I went there, I spoke no, none of the language, but I made flashcards. And because I needed it to live every single day everything i did i needed it so i just pounded the flashcard pounded the flashcards i remember my grandparents came up like a couple months later here and when they came i you know i, I figured oh good they're, they're here now because i was still struggling with the language and i figured they can speak for me and everything and when i came when they came up and we sat down in a restaurant to order i was listening to them speak japanese and i 
it was it, it was like they, they couldn't they were saying the wrong words they weren't they, like what i thought they were really fluent mm -hmm. they really couldn't get their message across a lot of times and barely got their message across and i found myself having to talk for them which was amazing then i you know until then i didn't think i was improving and when they came up i realized i was improving and it gave me more incentive more excitement to actually start pounding the flashcards i got i still have them I, I don't know where it is, but I still have about those little flashcards. I have some right here. I'm studying. I'm starting to study again another language, but I'm starting, starting to study Maori. So okay. This is uh, like the flashcards. Yeah? Oh. So you have, you have one word on one side, so English on one side, and then you have the, I have the Maori on the other side. Uh -huh. so, so you use these flashcards to study. So I had like, I must have had like 50 of them. All lined up in a little box and had all the words I felt was necessary for me to be able to converse and have a conversation in Japan. And yeah, so I would slam those and slam those and slam those. And when I, you know, when I first went up, you know, everything being in a foreign country, not having any friends, not understanding the customs, you know, because I was American Japanese in Hawaii, a lot of the customs um, my parents held on to. So we didn't, it wasn't that much of a shock with the custom, but. You know, just the language of the little bit change of custom, you know, the fact that I had to finally realize that I wasn't Japanese, I was actually American. That was a shock. And no money, um, didn't understand, didn't know the, you know, the places I couldn't get around. You know, it was, for me, it was something that wasn't somewhere that I wanted to be, but it was somewhere that I needed to be for the time being to improve my life when I get back to Japan. I mean, to get back to Hawaii. So that was my first image coming to Japan. It was just a temporary thing. I want to do what I got to do here, learn the language and get out of here and get back to Hawaii. Do you think that uh, like learning a language, because you know, some people have special talents and they're, they have a talent of learning a language easily. Do you think you have that in you? Because like me, I, when I went back to Korea, because now I've been living in Korea for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. you know, kind of similar to what you've been, you know, what you've done, you went back to Japan and you've been living there for, I don't know how many years, more than 20 years now, right? 28 and, years. Uh, yeah. So like me, when I first arrived, I spoke a little bit of Korean and barely read it, you know, and as the years go, you learn more and you learn the language, but still I'm not fluent. And I feel yeah. like, man, yeah. I don't think that I have a skill in learning a language but do you think you have the skill of learning the lang a language easily uh no i don't think anyone really has that skill and even how they say you learn one language the second one's going to be easier the third one's going to be even easier uh, i i don't know if there's actually a, a talent that you're good at learning languages i think it's more of a persistence perseverance um consistency i think anybody can you don't have to be have that certain skill or knack but everyone, I think it's, it's just, if you have the discipline, anyone can learn the language. So for me, I think for the Japanese, if you were to look at the way I picked up the Japanese language, it, it looks like I have that skill to learn language, but I think it was just something that I really needed to learn and really wanted to learn. So, you know, I've been going to Thailand a lot. So I've been off and on studying the Thai language and still today I can't come carry a complete conversation in Thai. You know, it's words here and there, fragments here and there. I can get my message across, uh, I'd say about maybe like, if it was only Thai, maybe 30% of the time. So if I've been going to Thailand for over, over 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be able to say that I have a good knack at speaking, speaking up the language because for 10 years, I still can't really fluently converse in Thai. So. I, I don't think so. I don't think I have that, that special knack that helps me pick up the language. When I first got to Korea and I started going around to markets, and, you know, you have to speak Korean. So I'm going around shopping or whatever I'm doing and I'm talking with these people and they're, they're like looking at me like, you know, they're giving me these weird looks and they're asking me, are you Chinese? And I'm like, oh, man, I'm, I'm fucking Korean, man. And they're like, oh, you speak like you're Chinese because your shit is so broken up. Did you uh, ever get that in Japan? Oh, yeah. Well, 
the, the, the hard part, I think, for you and for me was the fact that we look like, you look Korean, I look Japanese. So what happens when you go in there, one, if you don't get to talk to them or them, they understand what, where you're from, they, they think you're some like rude or socially retarded, uh, I, for me, socially retarded Japanese. Cause, so they look at you like you're, you know, like, you know, like in Japan, you have these little greetings. Like, you know, if you walk in, you say, um, seishimasu, and then you eat the meal, it's like, um, kosusama desu you know, that kind of stuff, you know, those little etiquette. And, you know, because I, I wasn't Japanese, I didn't understand that. But I do look Japanese. I look like a rude Japanese, yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, I get that where they think I'm Japanese. And then when they found that I'm not, they kind of, they don't know, when I speak, and it's like kind of broken Japanese. They kind of look at like, oh, they get, I can see they're confused. And I think my Japanese is good enough to a point where they're thinking I might be Japanese, but I might be like a real dumb Japanese. Like if my, my Japanese wasn't as good, maybe they could say right, right away, they'd be like, ah, oh, it's a foreigner. But my Japanese to that borderline point is like, oh, is he either a foreigner or he's a real dumb Japanese guy? So it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Huh? But yeah, the, the being, uh, being fluent, man, it's so hard. Do you feel like there's like a, a, a certain level of discrimination against like you're, you're like in the in between, you know, a lot of Koreans get this too, especially Koreans that lived in the US and then they go back to Korea. They're not accepted by the Koreans. But then in the US, you're not really accepted by the US either because you are Asian, you are a minority. So did you feel that when you went back to Japan? Yeah, well, see, the thing what we're lucky with is in Hawaii, it's, it's considered the melting pot of America where there's a, a big mixture of different races, you know, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Filipinos, the Chinese, there's a whole mixture. So there's not really much racism in Hawaii. So as far as being in Hawaii, I never felt that, oh, I don't belong here, you know, but of course you do to go to California because you're Asian, you know, it's kind of like you're Asian, you're not, are you American kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So... I got that in America and when I got to Japan, um, so I'm in Hawaii because it's such a melting pot. We all classify ourselves with our race, you know, like, so they asked me what I am. I've never ever said I was American. I always said I'm Japanese. And he asked me, well, what are you? Like, I'm Filipino. Oh, okay. So in Hawaii, it was never, we never classified ourselves as American. It was always a race that we were. So I'm going to Japan thinking that I'm Japanese. I go up there and every when I go to Japan and I'm telling them, they ask me, well, are you Japanese? And I realize that I cannot say I'm Japanese because I'm not a Japanese citizen. And I think Japan is probably the only, one of the first times I've ever called myself American. So yeah, it was, it's kind of weird because you go to Japan and you can't speak the language. It's like, I, I, although I did consider myself Japanese, all of a sudden to stay in the country that I thought was like my home country, I need a visa to stay there. To buy a car, I need a Japanese name on the title. If I'm gonna buy a house, I need 51% to be owned by a Japanese person back when I was first came to Japan. So yeah, I mean, not only do you get that social mob, I think maybe prejudice or social awkwardness where they kind of look at you like you're Japanese, but you can't speak the language. Not only that, you get this um, big uh, prejudice on the legalities actually live in the country. Did you have, like, what were some of the difficulties other than, you know, those difficulties of like buying a house or, you know, like when you went out and you met people, did they kind of treat you a different way? Like just regular people in the street? Um, I didn't really get any problems. That Back in the day, I didn't have any tattoos and, you know, I wasn't, I never was really a, a dick and walk around being causing trouble. So no, I didn't, I didn't have any particular problems. I just, I just remember that, you know, like standing in the train and maybe with a friend speaking English and people like literally turning around and looking right at you, like uh, in a real rude way, like, wouldn't you, for me, I'd suddenly look kind of little glance when the guy's not looking to look, Oh, it's English, but they'll turn around straight at you and look at you. And, um, you know, just those things that you, when you're foreign, you know, it's, you get looked at in a different way. So that was kind of like a shock for me. You're foreign, but you're not foreign. That's what's the weird part about it. 
Yeah, it's that you're Japanese, but you're not. You're American. You're Japanese, <laughs> yeah. but doesn't matter. You're American. Yeah. So that was real hard to actually accept. Yeah. How like when you? Yeah, you just said it was hard for you to accept. Like how? When did you decide? Like, hey, you know, I just gotta live with it. I, just, you know, I just gotta flow. Just forget about it. Um, life was really hard coming up here having to get a visa, having to struggle to get a visa, having to buy a car and have to have a Japanese person's name on it. Starting a company, you need a Japanese person on the company as far as, a, you know, one of the members in the corporation. Uh, you know, just, just that real struggle of, you know, just because I'm not Japanese citizen, I, they, they made life difficult for you. You know, I mean, when you look at it now, it's really good because they protect the Japanese people. You know, but in a way, it's, you feel like it's kind of not fair because they make it so hard for you to actually be able to come and live here. So, you know, for me, it was, um, what was the question? Like how, you know, when did you decide to just like push all the, you know, oh, like. Oh, yeah. So I, I was going through that whole thing where I had to struggle to do everything in Japan. And it was, for me, it was pretty frustrating because I felt I was Japanese. And I kind of had this real, real chip on my shoulder where I really got upset with it and to a point where I was like, you know what? I didn't feel so proud to be American until I came to Japan. And I, you know, I started calling myself an American and started, you know, feeling proud about it to a point where when I started fighting, it was amazing because when I, when I, everything I did, I was foreign, I was foreign, I was foreign. I started fighting and the, you know, the, I remember going into the ring thinking, okay, I look Japanese. They might mistake me for Japanese. And I was like, fuck, that's the last thing I would want is to be mistaken as Japanese. So my first uh, fight that I went in or my first four fights I went in, I remember specifically finding red, white, and blue shorts to fight in. And I would fight, used to fight in tights at the time. So specifically found red, white, and blue tights to fight in. So that was my big resentment that I had. My first four fights, I, you know, I, I didn't like that. They, they, like, I remember once I started getting famous, they started trying to call me Japanese. I remember fighting that and telling them I'm not Japanese. One of the videos when they, when they have your fight in a fight video and they have your name on it, you know, they have the word, what country you represent, they had a Japanese. Mm -hmm. So I remember getting in touch with that company, telling them that I'm not Japanese, put American. That's, I'm not Japanese, that's a mistake. Making them change that. So I had a real big chip about, when it, because I was came to Japan and I was treated with prejudice, like I wasn't a Japanese, I'm gonna be even stronger and more, more intense about being a model American. So that was my whole thing. And as I was going into fighting, you know, it was in, I kind of resented the fact that just because I got famous, they started trying to take me in as a Japanese. But I don't know because I could speak the language now as I was fighting. And the fact that I had Japanese blood, they made an exception for that, you know, because I, I was like a strong fighter. And they started slowly taking me in as a Japanese person. And the chip prevented me from absorbing that to a point where I kind of sat back and said, hey, wait a minute, why am I fighting this? This is actually a good thing that they're actually take, wanting to take me in as their own. So for me, it was like, why am I fighting this? I, maybe I should just drop the chip. Maybe I was accepted. And I thought too, as a fighter, to get fans is also a good thing. So I figured if I get fans and it's a good thing, then you know maybe it could make my popularity go up, get offered more fights. So I thought, you know what? I'll drop that chip. And I said, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll be proud and I'll fight in Japan and I'll, I won't be, you know, too concerned about I'm American, I'm not Japanese. I just fought as a fighter and see how the Japanese people take me. You know, they, they took to me a lot and they took me really well to a point where, I don't know, there was a change in me during that fighting period where, yeah, you know, the question is when I had that change. I realized I had that change when, I actually had a chance to fight in Abu Dhabi in a super fight against uh, Mario Sperry. And when I went there, again, because I, they flew me out from Japan and I looked Japanese, I guess the Abu Dhabi people didn't realize that 
I was American. So when they had me line up, you know, you know, Abu Dhabi had like at the time it was just all by invitation. Yeah, the sheikh would invitate, invite all of us. So everyone was invited. They had Brazil, had America, had Canada, had all the countries lined up. So what they did in the opening ceremony was they had a flag, and they had everybody line up behind their flag. And I remember when they called my name up, it was Japan, and I had to stand behind the Japan flag. And I remember. You know, I didn't, you know, it was already set. The whole program was set. I couldn't just say, no, I, I don't want to be there. I want to go and run to the American side because I already had me listed as Japanese. So I went and just lined up the Japanese flag. And I don't know, when, when they were making the announcements and doing the ceremony, there was a little change in me where I realized that something inside of me changed because I remember feeling a little proud about representing Japan. I'm going to show them how strong us, our fighters are in Japan. You know, I, I had this role change. Like, there was a little bit of, I had that pride of fighting for Japan. And that's when I realized that, oh, there's a little bit of change in me that I'm accepting Japan as my home. And that's when I realized that it, it, it actually, I actually did let it go. What, you know, we're going to get into all of that eventually in the future. What, what year did you first step into Japan? I think it was 1990. 1990. So it was about five years later where you actually had your first professional fight. Yeah. Okay, so when so I went to Japan, the whole thing was about being in Japan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I needed a visa. So it was about teaching English. That's all, that's all I did. I was, in, I was in Fukushima and I taught English full time. Played racquetball at a sports club nearby. Um, taught English. And... I, when I left uh, Hawaii to go to Japan, I was in love with Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I was at house in Gracie's gym. I was training every day, every single day. Every day I had free, I was over at the house, at Helsin's house, watching videos. I had like the bug. I remember going to Japan saying, I'm going to go for a racquetball tournament. I'll be right back. I didn't realize at the time I was going to stay out my visa to try and do seminars. and didn't realize I was going to try to stay eventually. I remember Helsin telling me, don't go. And I remember telling Helsin, don't worry, because I was Helsin's top student. Helped him do seminars in Hawaii, and he, he really needed me to be there. And I told him, I'll be back in two weeks somewhere. And he, I remember Helsin looked at me and said, don't go. You're not coming back. And it was so weird. It didn't dawn on me. You know, for me, I just thought, ah, Helsin's being silly. But then I thought back about it, saying, wow, it's kind of weird how he told me that. But, you know, when I went to Japan, it was only supposed to be for a little while. So you were doing seminars, racquetball seminars, jujitsu yeah. seminars? Racquetball. So as I'm in, 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 in Japan doing teaching the English and playing racquetball, because my love for jiu-jitsu was so big, I would try and gather, you know, English, other English teachers, and they had no jiu-jitsu background. But I would go into the uh, – rent out the little gymnasiums, the little mat for, a little, for an hour. I would teach them the basics, thinking to myself, if I keep teaching these guys jiu-jitsu – in three or four years, I'll actually have guys that can spar with me and be good enough. So we would, in our free time, I would take them to the mats and show them all the jiu-jitsu stuff, you know, how to get out of the mound, how to take the mound, you know, all those basic stuff. Whenever there was like, you know, I remember there were times that we, in the sports club, the racquetball sports club, the, guy, the guys come in the weight room and you can tell that they're wrestlers or they've done something. And I would always talk to them and if they're wrestlers, I remember bringing down a bunch of Iranian wrestlers before to the to the mats, sparring with them, working jiu-jitsu with them, everything. I, I mean, it was like, I was in Japan, just being a full-time English teacher, trying to pursue my racquetball career in Japan, and on the side, getting in as much jiu-jitsu as I can. So I always had that love for jiu-jitsu. When you went over there, that was Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Then there's Brazilian jiu-jitsu comes from Japanese jiu-jitsu. Like, what were the biggest differences? Did you go to uh, dojos over there and, you know, spar with some of the Japanese jiu-jitsu guys or anything like that? No, you, you the jiu-jitsu um, in Japan has actually been, uh, it's been changed. You know, of course, Brazilian jiu-jitsu came from, you know, the jiu-jitsu in Japan. But as the jiu-jitsu in Japan is actually a lost art. As the teachers taught jiu-jitsu, they started taking out the certain moves so that the student would never become better than them. So as jiu-jitsu went on, it started losing the art because like 
each teacher would hold back moves. And jiu-jitsu actually is the base of judo. So in order to make jiu-jitsu a sport, they form judo. And jiu-jitsu kind of fizzled out. So yeah, I've never been to jiu-jitsu school. The closest thing that there was to jiu-jitsu was kosen judo, which is a judo that works a lot of ground. I think the judo and kosen judo is a little different on the rules where they allow a lot more ground grappling, so more jiu-jitsu style of grappling. But as far as a, a pure jiu-jitsu school, never been there. Never saw one, still can't find one. So throughout the five years, you know, when you first arrived in Japan to the point where you fought, you're, you're teaching English, you're learning Jap Japanese, you're playing racquetball, you're, you're creating your own little group of jiu-jitsu, you know, assassins. Yeah. Uh, like some of these guys that you were doing, you, you know, you're practicing jiu-jitsu with, you're teaching them jiu-jitsu, they, did they go on to become like owners of gyms or anything like that? Or were they just, you know, just regular people? No, they're just regular people. So they just, they, of course, you know, the English, you know, the wrestlers like that from Iran were in and out, just in the country for a little bit, took off, never saw them again. The English teacher guys that were there, you know, one of the guys was this guy, Baron, that was with me. He um, was teaching English, but his whole thing, he was never a fighter. He never planned to be a fighter, but he was interested in learning jiu-jitsu. Um, he eventually, you know, did his English job. Then his term went back to Hawaii, and he's working in Hawaii now. And he's never did continue jiu-jitsu. So everyone that I thought was pretty much just there to, I was hoping that maybe they would be get hooked on it to a point where they could get good enough that would actually push me in my sparring to keep improving my jiu-jitsu. But it never did flourish like that. But I tried. <laughs> was there any barriers when you were teaching jiu-jitsu? Did anybody come along and be like, hey, what are you doing? You know, did anybody challenge you? No, it, the only farthest thing from the challenge is the, the wrestler guys that would come in. They didn't know what jiu-jitsu was, so we would, we would spar, and they would um, they would want to do wrestling, but I, I would fall to my back. And, of course, you know, in jiu-jitsu, the basic position is like you're getting pinned already, so getting, getting the guard is not a good thing. So I had to explain to them that, you know, we go to submission, and these guys were real big, strong guys. So, yeah, they would... The farthest thing from a challenge is they wouldn't they didn't understand jiu-jitsu. So they, after I would rent, submit them or something, they would want to do it again, do it again, do it again, until it came to a point they realized that this is a whole different thing from wrestling. But uh, not, not, I didn't get any challenges. It was more just um, the lack of uh, knowledge of what it was and actually um, educating them on what jiu-jitsu was. When did you decide to, like, stop playing racquetball, stop teaching English, and just focus on jiu-jitsu? Was there okay, a so the, Yeah, there was. So the first year I went to Japan, I was teaching English, um, learning the, the language. After the year was up, I was like, okay, if I go back to Hawaii, I won't retain it. So I said, okay, I'll do one more year. Then another year, the second year, I felt, okay, my Japanese is probably good enough that I would retain it and decided, okay, I want to go home. But as... I decided to go home. Egan had his own racquetball company. It was called E-Force Japan. And he, I mean, E-Force, it was called E-Force. And he actually said, hey, why don't you try and set up something where you can start doing E-Force for me, repping the, the rackets for me? I was like, oh, that's a good idea. I'll give it a try. So I started that on my, on my second year and it actually took off and got really good to a point where I was saying, okay, now the second year's up, the, com the company's moving. I'm going to the third year in the company thinking, okay, I want to eventually go back to Hawaii. So I'm going to have to get this company sturdy enough and find someone I can trust that I can hire so I can go back to Hawaii. So that was the next step. So working the fourth year comes around and this company gets sturdy. I got a guy that I think I can trust, ask him to take the company. Okay, it's done. Okay, now finally I think I'm going back to Japan. Then I remember playing racquetball and, you know, you go into any sport you play, you go into a court and you can hit a, a ball. But once you get into the, the tournament, there's jitters, there's nervousness. You can't control your emotions, so you can't be the same person. With that in mind, I remember watching a show where a family was driving down the road, their car turned over, and it got caught on fire. And because the father was in so much panic, 
he couldn't open a car door. It was, all there was was upside down, and he couldn't manage to open it because he was panicking and pulling the door before pushing the, the button in good. And he, because he couldn't control his emotions, his whole family died. Mm-hmm. I remember thinking to myself that I want to control my emotions. If if anything happens, if big car accident, somebody gets bleeding, the guts gushing out, I want to be able to think straight to be able to help these people, especially if it's one of my family members or my my, my girlfriend or my wife, you know, so I, I always thought that I wanted to be able to control my emotions. The racquetball was a good channel to do that. And I remember to a point where I could pretty much feel like the, the person that was practicing every day, I could control my jitters in the racquetball court. So I felt, okay, that's cool. And I remember going to, you know, after moving to Japan, the fourth year, um, I remember I'm ready to go home. I remember, oh, Hicks and Gracie, we're friends with the Gracies because we're training under Helsin. Horian, Hoyce, Hickson, Hoyler, they would all come into Hawaiian train. So we got to know them really well. So when Hickson was coming, I actually got tickets from Hickson to watch him fight in the Volatudo Japan. I think it was the Volatudo Japan 1990. Oh, 1994, I think it was. And Hickson won the tournament. I remember sitting there watching Hickson fight and being a friend of Hickson's. I remember watching him thinking, oh, getting a little nervous, but when he got into the ring and started fighting, I remember not being able to control my emotions. I remember getting so excited to a point where I started screaming and jumping when he won. And right there, it dawned on me like, oh, holy shit. Okay, I could control my emotions in a racquetball tournament, in the national tournament, in the all-grass court. But I remember thinking like, oh, this is a whole nother level of controlling your emotions. I remember thinking that, oh, I can't even control seeing my friend fight in the ring. How would it be? It would be triple as hard, tw- three times as hard to control my emotions if I were in the ring. Then that's when I had this little, um, this uh, mission in mind that I'm going to get in the ring once and feel that fear, feel that emotion, feel that anxiety to see if I could control myself, which I doubt I could. But I always thought that if I, whether I could control it or not, just to have that experience would help me in the future if something comes up that I had to control my emotions that might be life and death for someone I really care one day. So I had this idea like, okay, I want to get in the ring once now. I want to try and get in the ring just once to, just to see how that would feel. So then I went on this little mission to search and I searched rings, pancreas, um, UWF. I checked all those sites thinking, okay, I don't know how to strike. So if anything would be, uh, Associates that I could use my ground. So I Googled them all. UWF, I remember calling them and them telling me, Are you, oh, you got to be higher, taller than 5'8 and you have to be under 22 years old. And I was like, Why does that matter how old you are? And it's like, Okay, I make the height, but it's like, Why does it matter how tall you are? It's like, Oh, this is probably bullshit. This is pro wrestling. So I said, Forget it. Scratch that. I remember calling rings and pancreas and they told me you got to submit a um a resume and then wait for them to call me for uh they say a shin deshi is a new new boy test so they would call in all the people who want and put them through like a regimen of sparring and physical fitness and all so okay i'll wait for that so i actually took those pictures filled out my resume and what i did and everything sent it to the pancreas and rings and now as i was waiting i found this association called shuto so, oh, Shuto, that, that one, oh, no ground punching. You know, Shuto at the time had, had a sport where they did submissions, but on the ground, they couldn't punch. So, oh, but that is kind of close. I, I prefer pancreas because you could open, open palm. Uh, that could use a bunch of jiu-jitsu more in pancreas, but I was saying, ah, you know what? Let me just call Shuto. So I went and called Shuto. I remember um, someone answered the phone, and I said, oh, I experienced, introduced myself, said I kind of want to try and see if I can fight or, you know, get into the amateur ring maybe once. So um, they called me and they said, oh yeah. I mean, you know, Shuto was a raw unorganized association at the time. So they said, okay, come down. I was like, oh, I was expecting to get declined or um, be told that I got to send in a resume and all, like I usually, like I did for the other places. But they said, come down. So I was like, oh, come down. Okay, jumped on the Shinkansen. Next day I'm down in the Omiya gym, the Omiya Shuto gym. I remember, Walking in there, there was this big guy. His name was Sayama Satoru. He was the first Tiger Mask and the, the founder of Shuto. 
remember walking in and he's kind of like laughing, saying, oh yeah, come, come, you are, what did you do? And I said, I did Gracie Jiu Jitsu and he knew Gracie Jiu Jitsu. He goes, oh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, oh, good, good. And you know, he's probably thinking there's some dude that just did Gracie Jiu Jitsu for a little while. So, so oh, okay, good, good, good. You wanna, um, let me see, let me see what you got. So he goes, oh, he calls out to this little student that was uh, training on the mat. And he said, oh, why don't you um, spar with Ensign? Okay, I said, oh, this guy's like, I was like, I think at the time I was like 180 pounds. This guy's like 140 pounds. I think, I'm going to spar with this little dude. Okay, we spar. Of course, um, Gracie Jiu Jitsu was so new at the time that they didn't understand the ground, the positioning. So I took positions, mounted the guy, no striking, just grappling. I remember foot locks being a problem and, you know, getting, trying to stay away from his foot locks. But I remember controlling the guy the whole time. And, Right then, we finished sparring. And I remember the teacher. I remember look, him sitting up and looking at the other guy that I sparred with. He goes, oh, we can use this guy. I was like, well, it kind of sounded like I felt like, a, like a, a, not a human being. I felt like a thing. Like, like we can use him. Like, oh. And the guy looked at me and said, you want to get in the ring? I said, yes, that's my objective. I want to just get in the ring once. He goes, okay. Um, three months, you make your pro debut. I'm like, whoa. For, for me, I was like, oh, pro debut. No, I don't want to. I'm not pro. I haven't fought before. I just want to amateur ring. I don't care what it is. I just want to get in the ring. And then he tells me, don't worry. Don't worry. You'll be okay. I'll train you. You'll be ready. Everything. I was like, oh, I don't know about that. But I just went with the flow. I said, okay. And um, he got me a fight. I remember that fight thinking, okay, this is my fight. I got to just fight once. I'm going to go in the ring and feel the, the emotion and see if I can control it and just experience it. Went in there. Of course, the emotion was crazy. I got the mount, but um, he actually, Sayama made a new, the new style. It was called freestyle shooting. So that was the first full-on Vali Tudo event that they've had in Japan. So he created this um, freestyle shooting and it allowed brown punching. So it was kind of a big change for the crowd to see a guy on top pounding the guy. But I got so excited. I remember getting tired. I couldn't control my emotions, but I, you know, I got tired and, Okay, I won the fight. Luckily, won the fight. I remember thinking, okay, done. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be able to control my emotions if I did that again, but at least I got that chance to maybe be able to be a little stronger in controlling my emotions in the future. And that was the whole objective, not be able to exactly be able to control it 100%, but to have that experience to give me that experience to maybe better could be able to control it in the future. I was done. It was one fight. And that's the reason why I went in the ring was because I wanted to learn to control my emotions. You know, a lot of these guys go in and see the champs and say, I want to be a champion. I want the UFC belt. I want to make money. I want to be famous. It was none of that for me. For me to get in the ring was just to control my emotions. And that was the reason why I went in the ring. So that, you know, like going up to the timeline, it was my fourth year in Japan. And I was like, I'm going to fight once and then I'm going to leave and I want to, can't wait to go out to Hawaii and start surfing again, everything. And Sayama was super excited. He asked me to please beg me to fight one more. I felt obligated. One fight led to another, to another. And uh, the fourth fight, I said, okay, this is my last fight. I fought a K1 fighter, Andre Manad, which was a kind of renowned K1 fighter in Japan. I remember saying, okay, I'm done with this. I want to fight. I fought, I won. And, Instead of thinking of going back to Hawaii, I remember in my head something clicked like, shit, that was a legitimate K1 fight. I beat him. And I thought to myself, okay, wait a minute. I might be pretty good at this. Let me see how good I can do it. You know, it changed my whole outlook from gaining that experience of controlling my anxiety to like, oh, wait a minute. I might be good at this. Maybe I can become the best in the world. And it changed my whole outlook and I went gung ho on training. So that's how the, the career took off, actually. It was something that I didn't plan or didn't want or didn't expect to do. All right, we're going to stop right here for part two. Because I think, man, you, you explained so much, but there's so much, like, little details, you know, of what you said right now, what you explained that we could get into. So on the next episode, we'll, uh, on the next part, we'll get into more about Shudo and, and about the, the scene of MMA in Japan, at that time, it wasn't even MMA, right? No, there was no MMA. It was there was uh, pretty much grappling and kickboxing. K1 was big, and then they had like the UWF, where it was only grappling, no striking. So yeah, there wasn't really an MMA.
All right, we'll get into all of that in part three. Until then, you know, if you got any questions, send your questions. And Ensign, we'll see you on the next one. Shoot, right on. <laughs>